We're going to read from Psalms 107, 1 through 43. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say this, those he redeemed from the land of the foe, those he gathered from the lands, from east and west, from north and south. Some wandered in the desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by the straight way to the city where they could settle. Let's give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for man, for he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. Some sat in darkness and the deepest gloom, prisoners suffering in iron chains, for they had rebelled against God's word the, and despised the counsel of the Most High. So he subjected them to bitter labor. They stumbled, and there was no one to help. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He brought them out of the darkness and the greatest gloom and broke away their chains. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. For he breaks down gates of bronze and cuts through bars of iron. Some became fools through their rebellious ways and suffered affliction because of their inequities. They loathed all food and drew near the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent forth his word, and he healed them. He rescued them from the grave. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for, for men. Let them sacrifice, thank offerings, and tell of, their, of his works with songs of joy. Others went out on the sea in ships, and they were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord and his wonderful deeds in the deep, for he spoke and stirred up a tempest and lifted high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In their peril, their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunken men. They were at their wit's end. They cried out, oh, cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love, for his wonderful deeds for men. Let them exalt him in the assembly of the people and praise him in the council of the elders. He turned rivers into a desert, flowing springs into thirsty ground, and fruitful land into a salt waste. Because of the wickedness of those who live there, he turned the desert into pools of water and the parched ground into flowing springs. There he brought the hungry to live, and they founded a city where they could settle. They sowed fields and planted vineyards that yielded a fruitful harvest. He blessed them, and their numbers greatly increased, and he did not let their herds diminish. Then their numbers decreased, and they were humbled by oppression, calamity, and sorrow. He who pours contempt on nobles made them wander in a trackless waste. But he lifted the needy out of their affliction and increased their families like flocks. The upright see and rejoice, but all the wicked shut their mouths. Whoever is wise, let him heed these things and consider the great love of the Lord. Where are you? It's kind of a funny question by itself because we know where we are, right? We're, we're right here. <laughs> Anytime we answer that question, we're, we're here. Wherever we are is here. But when you put that, that question in context, it, it brings about meaning. Most of us have asked that question at one time or another. Where are you? Maybe as a, a child looking for his, his dog that's run off. As a parent of teenagers, I, I often text, where are you? <laughs> And uh, we're, you know, wherever. Sometimes, if, if it gets answered. <laughs> I remember one time uh, being at a friend's house. And, the, you know, the, the moms were over in the one area talking. And us dads were over doing one thing. And the kids were up running around. And, and we, we started realizing as we started doing a head count on the kids, there were a couple missing. And that's, that's bad. Uh, they were little. And so we... You know, the mom started getting excited. The dads were getting excited, but we played like we weren't. You know, we were all cool. It'd be fine. 
And so we started shouting, where are you, to these kids that were missing. And we lived close to a park, and the park was actually across the street, but it was not a good street for three, four, five-year-olds to cross. And so we got kind of frantic, thinking that they must have gone to the park, because they like being at the park. So we started, you know, shouting, where are you, to these kids. And eventually we found them. They thought it would be fun to hide in the closet. They didn't, the, the grown-ups didn't think it was as fun as, as they thought. But, but we, we were shouting to these kids, where are you? And if you're a a parent of children, maybe you've asked that question before as your kid wandered off in the store or or you were somewhere. And it's it's scary. It's a terrifying feeling. Well, one day God came to the Garden of Eden after He created the heavens and the earth and He created all things and He created Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve were in the garden and they did the one thing that God asked them not to do. And because of that, they were afraid, and so they hid, and God comes walking, and the question he asked was, where are you? And Adam had to come out from his hiding and say, we're right here. We were hiding because we were naked and afraid. And oftentimes, we find ourselves in that situation. Oftentimes, we find ourselves asking the question, but so often, we find ourselves being asked that question, where are you? We wander and we get lost. We, we find out we're alone. And when we're alone, we feel like we're unloved, as if God has, has rejected us, as if God has stopped looking for us. But God never stops seeking. God never stops asking the question, Where are you? He does this because of His great love for, for you and His great love for me. Even when we wander, even when we run from Him, even when running from Him seems like the proper response. I remember when I was about 13 years old, my brother got in trouble, which was not uncommon. And my dad asked him, because my dad was a a, a spanker, we, we got lots of spankings. My dad told my brother, he said, go in the garage, I'm going to go get my belt, and you're going to get a spanking. And, you know, it was not an uncommon thing in our house to get spanking, so it was no big deal. You know, I just sat there and watched TV. He went out in the garage. And instead of doing what he was supposed to do, which was wait there for Dad to to come out in the garage and deliver the punishment that he deserved, my brother thought it would be best to run. (laughs) And they found him a couple streets over (laughs) running from my mom and dad. That didn't help, obviously. Just made things worse. But that's a common response when we, when we have violated the commands of God, so often we want to run from Him. And even when we wander, even when we run from Him, God's love never fails. God continuously calls out, Where are you? So how do we respond to a God of endless love? What is a proper response to to a God who searches out for us even when we're lost, even when we reject Him, even when we turn our backs and head the other way. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to Psalm 107, which is the passage of Scripture that that Roy and Sheree and Juanita read for us this morning. Just hold it open right there. We're going to be there this entire morning, Psalm 107. This is the continuation of our series, Songs of Hope. Last week we talked about hope. Uh, for the hopeless, and we talked earlier about hope for the insignificant. Today we're going to talk about hope for the unloved. And so often when we find ourselves running from God, or, or away from God, or separated from God in some way, we feel isolated and alone. And so much of us, so much of that turns into a feeling of unloved, being unloved. So let's look at uh, Psalm 107. We're going to start in verse 1. How do we respond to a God of endless love? The answer is right here. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. For His steadfast love endures forever. We respond to the Lord. We respond to a God of endless love by by calling out and and thanking Him. Verse 2 and 3. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom He has redeemed from trouble and gathered from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. It says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And what it means there is basically give thanks to the Lord. What, what do we say so? Our say so is by giving thanks to the Lord for, the, for His love, being thankful for Him, for all He's done for us, for, for, for redeeming us. It says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Almost every week, 
probably not every week, but almost every week, I use that word redeem. And I got to thinking this week, maybe there are some of you in here, we, we use words a lot of times as Christians or people who have gone to church for a long time, we use words just because we know them and we use them all the time. But I thought maybe some of you don't know what that word means. It's, it's not a word we use uh, too often outside of, of church. I mean, maybe if we're going to redeem a coupon or something like that. But what does it mean in, in, in the biblical sense to be redeemed? In the Old Testament, there, were, there was a, a process uh, a, that, a, that a family member could redeem someone else. If, for example, if a, a, um, a husband of a wife were to die, she would have no income. She would obviously be a hard-working lady. She would work in the home taking care of her family and kids, but, but that didn't pay. And so she would need somebody to take care of her. So, the God, or so God set up a system where the, the, the man who died's brother would marry her, take her family in, bring her in. This was called kinsman redeemer. It was, so redeemed basically means to be brought into the family. So as, as people who are redeemed by God, we are brought into his family as sinners, those who have violated God's command, which all of us are. We have turned our back on God and left God's uh, loving embrace. As a, as a child runs from his dad, we've done that. And so to be redeemed is to be brought back into the family of God. And when we run, on, run away and we turn our backs and we uh, neglect God and, and, and get away from God, we're lost. And there's God looking for us, searching for us, calling out, where are you? Not because He doesn't know, but because so that we would know that He's there. And it's in those moments that we need to cry out to God and it seems like, like, like hiding would be the best answer, or like my brother, like running would be the best answer. But the solution to our sense of lostness, to our sense of being alone, to our sense of being unloved is to cry out to God. So how do we do that? What does that look like? How do we cry out to Him? In this chapter, Psalm 107, there are, there are four different examples, uh, four different examples of people. It's really not a, a type of person, it's really a a position this person is in, in, in relation to God. So there are four positions that people get in in this chapter where they cry out to God, where they're lost and alone and they feel unloved. I want to give a, a special tip of the hat to um, Bob Sarif, or I'm not sure if, that's, if I'm saying that right, who wrote the book Sunrise of Hope. I leaned heavily on it this week. Outstanding book while I was doing my study. But he listed these. So let's look at these. Psalm 107, four categories or four positions of, of people and how they cry out to God. They're, they're listed in your bulletin there if you want to write them down. Number one is this. We cry out as a restless people. Psalm 107, four through seven says this. Some wandered in desert waste, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way. And they reached a city to dwell in. These people are wanderers. Some of you are wanderers. Some of the people you know are wanderers. They wander from job to job. From, from, from city to city. From town to town. State to state. From, from one person to the next. Relationship to relationship. From church to church. They wander. They're lost. They're looking. And God says, those people who, who are wanderers, those people who are looking, who are searching, in verse 6 it says, they cried out to God. And He led them. He saved them. He delivered them. He made their way straight. These are restless people. So can restless people cry out to God? Look at verse 8 and 9. Here's how they cry out to God. Let them thank the Lord for His steadfast love, for His wondrous works to the children of men, for He satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul He fills with good things. As restless people, those of you who are restless people or those who know restless people, when you're looking and searching and wandering, you feel like you're all alone, you're unloved, but God says cry out to Him. And He will fill those needs. He will fill you from the inside out, so can restless people cry out to God? The answer is yes. Number two, how do we cry out to Him as crushed people? As crushed people. Look at verse 10 through 12. 
Some sat in darkness in the shadow of death, prisoners in affliction and in irons, for they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. So He bowed their heads down with hard labor. They fell down with none to help. These people are crushed because they have rejected the ways of God. I mean, they knew it. They saw it. It was right there in front of them. They, they had been going in this direction at one point, and they said, no, I'm not going to go that way anymore. God's commands are not important to me. And so many of us fall into this category, right? I mean, maybe most of the time we follow God's commands. Most of the time we, we do what God says. We follow what God wants us to be, what God wants us to do. But, but there are some areas of our life where we say, no, God, you're, you're kind of off limits there. A lot of us as Christians, we, we do this with our sex life. We say, God, you're not allowed in this area. It's my body. I do what I want to do in my bedroom. So as far as you're concerned, God, and as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to follow you except here. For some of you, you're, you're tremendous at business. You're outstanding businessmen and women, and you go to work, and you do all the things that you need to do, and sometimes there becomes a conflict with, with what, God, what you know God says about ethics and morality and those type of things, and and what you know or believe you need to do in your business to make things go right. And so you say, God, yeah, I can't let you be a part of this. I'm going to follow you in all the other ways, but this I can't do. Or with our money. It's a big area for so many of us. We say, God, I've earned this. I've worked hard. This is mine. And so oftentimes when we do that, what we're doing is we're rejecting God. And oftentimes what happens is we find ourselves wandering and lost and detached. And we wonder... What happened? Where is God? Does God not love me anymore? So can crushed people, people who have rebelled against God, can crushed people cry out to God? Obviously the answer is yes. Look at 13 through 16. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and He delivered them from their distress. He brought them out of the darkness and the shadow of death and burst their bonds apart. Let them thank the Lord for His steadfast love. For his wondrous works to the children of man. For he shatters the doors of bronze and cuts into the bars of iron. This is the idea of of returning to God. Being wayward. This is is what repentance is all about. Seeing where you're wrong as it relates to God and his word. And turning away from that and going in the other direction. This doesn't mean that we'll never sin again. But it means that in our in our, in our efforts to please God because of His great love for us, we're going to live our lives as He has called us to live them. And to the outside world, trying to live and to, to, to live a, a life that's righteous, it, it sounds like a hypocritical thing when we, when we do that and we even talk about those things, but it's trying to live as God calls us to live, turning away from the sin that separates us from God, crying out to Him so that those things are easier to to do for us knowing that he can do those things through us and it brings us out of the darkness when we live our lives as if God's word doesn't matter in certain areas or if God's commands don't matter we we can get this feeling of lostness and darkness like like God's not there anymore like he doesn't love us but in those times we're to cry out to God and he'll be there for us to bring us out of the darkness So how do we cry out to Him? Number three. We cry out as blind people. Look at verses 17 and 18. Some were fools through their sinful ways. And because of their iniquities, they suffered affliction. They loathed any kind of food. And they drew near to the gates of death. They were fools because they were blind. Not physically blind, obviously. But they were... They were blinded. They had been blinding themselves to the very ways of God. They're they're blind because they're not looking at the truth of God that's right there in front of them. John Weiss, this week, while I was at the North American Christian Convention, John Weiss is the the, um, senior minister at at Southland Christian Church in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, John was the the, um, Wednesday night speaker. And he tells a story about being in Haiti. And there was this blind man... There was, there was a beggar, and he uh, saw him one day and, and, and gave him some, some uh, food. Uh, a, few, a little while later, he saw him again, but he was, uh, he was roped. He had a rope around his waist, and it was around the waist of a teenage boy in front of him. And this boy was just dragging him along, you know, guiding, not really dragging him, but guiding him along, 
because he was blind. He didn't know where he was going or what he was doing. So, so this was a way uh, for him to get around. Well, John said he recognized the guy, and he went up to him and, and, and started talking to him. And, and, and John says that this guy says, can I pray for you? <laughs> Which is funny because here we have this blind man in a third world country who has nothing. And he says, can I pray for you? And John says, absolutely. And in this man's prayer, he said, may he see God. May he see you as I see you. And so many of us are, are seeing. We can physically see what's right in front of us, yet we're spiritually blind and we ignore the ways of God. We're blind. And the psalmist says that people who are like this are fools. And it seems kind of harsh in our culture to call somebody a fool. I mean, that, those are fighting words, right? But when somebody is looking at something that's true in front of them and they absolutely ignore it, what are they? They're fools, right? When I was 16, I remember being foolish over and over. But one time in particular, I had, uh, as in Kentucky, when, you're, when you get your permit when you're 16, and, and at this time, you had to wait a month as if one month was enough training, right, for you to get your license. So I, I got my license, I, birthday's in December, get my license in January, and four days later, a friend of ours had a Super Bowl party. Her mom and dad had her invite all her friends over. There was a bunch of us over there. Her mom and dad had food for us. And at halftime, I thought it would be a good idea to go out and just drive around. Well, it was raining. It was a bad idea. And I ended up crashing. I went, it was a country road, and I went down the hill four days after I got my license. Went down the hill and into a creek that was swollen because of the rain. And it was not so deep that my car would get lost in it or anything like that. But I hit the water, and obviously when you hit the water, your car stops. And I was foolish in all of those ways leading up to that. But, but more importantly, or more specifically, I was foolish because I wasn't wearing my seatbelt. And, you know, it, it, we know, we know the, the deal with the seatbelt. You wear your seatbelt because even little crashes can be devastating when you don't wear your seatbelt. Anyone who doesn't wear their seatbelt... And there's some of you probably who don't. But anyone who doesn't wear their seatbelt, giving the information, the facts that we know, is foolish. And so on this day, I was extremely foolish. And when I crashed, my face hit the windshield. And I busted up my face, was bleeding. And, and I think, I knew the truth. And I was extremely foolish. And what, what the psalmist is saying here is that these people, they know the ways of God. They know the truth that's right in front of them. They look at it and they say, nah. That's foolish. And we'll reject God. And many of us have been in this position. We, we reject the things of God. And, and that's foolish. We turned a blind eye to God in His ways. We've, we've blinded ourselves from the truth. And in doing so, we've made ourselves fools. And it causes us to feel like, like God's not there. When we stand up and we look at it and we think, wait a minute, God, what's, what's going on? Where are you? I, are you not even here? I, I feel unloved like you're not even there. But in, in reality, we have blinded ourselves from the truth of God. Gone our own way, separated ourselves from God. And it's God who's saying, where are you? And so can blind people who have turned a blind eye to the truth of God, can blind people cry out to God? Hopefully you're seeing a pattern here. Because the answer is yes. Look at verses 19 through 22. Then they cried to the Lord. These are the blind. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and He delivered them from their distress. He sent out His word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. Let them thank the Lord for His steadfast love, for His wondrous works to the children of man, and let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of His deeds and songs of joy. We turn a blind eye to God and we cry out to Him, God heals us. He restores us. And how does He do it? It says He restores them by sending them His Word to heal them. I wonder what kind of verse God would send if we cried out to Him as blind. There was people who had turned a blind eye to His truth. I wonder what, what God would send to us. What word He would send to us. I wonder what word He would send to the people in, in Psalms as they were reading this. You know, who knows? But I think probably a good one would be Joel 2.32, which is not only there in Joel, but quoted several times in the New Testament. And it basically is this. All who cry out to God, all who 
call on the name of the Lord will be saved. All who cry out to God will be saved. Even those who are blind to the truth. How do we cry out to Him? Number four, finally, as fearful people. Look at verses 23 through 27. Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, His wondrous works in the deep. For He commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven. They went down into the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. I forgot how far I was supposed to go, 27. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wits' end. These people are just going about their business. They, they work on a boat, right? They go to the boat. They, they do their thing. They're on ships. They're, they're going about their, their daily business, doing what they're supposed to be doing. And they come to the reality that all their things that they had been doing are small and insignificant compared to mighty God. And so many of us are like this. So many of us are like this in that we put our trust in ourselves. We put our trust in our work. These men were putting their trust in their ships or their navigational skills or their sailing skills. We put our trust in other things other than God. And they found out that those things, in the, in the case of these men, those things could not withstand the power and might of God. And we find out the same is true in our lives. We can't stand up to God. And my fear for us in this room is that so many of us get entrapped by this. We get ensnared by this idea because we're so blessed. I mean, we have money. And some of you say, I don't have as much as them, but I guarantee you, you have more money than most of the world. We're rich beyond belief. We have wisdom. We have access to information. We have knowledge and understanding so many of us have education we're we are so unbelievably blessed and we feel like we can handle things on our own like we don't need God like I can do this I can handle this I can I can make that happen I'll be fine on my own and in doing so we're putting our hope in something else or in, in most of our cases in in someone else we're putting our hope in ourselves other than God and it becomes a terrifying thing when what we put our hope in cannot stand up against God. And for the case of these men, they realized that their hope was in themselves or in their ships. And when they saw the storm, they knew it was no match for God in our lives. Or like that when we put our hope in ourselves, when we put our hope in our money and our jobs and our security. When those things are God gone, we realize that those things weren't worth putting our hope in. And just so you know, this is a huge personal struggle for me. This is probably the, the biggest area in my life where I struggle, where I feel like I want to be the one who's in control. I want to be the one who makes the decisions, who, who, who finds out the answers, who does this or does that. I want to rely on myself instead of on God. And so when we do that, when we live our lives like that and the tempest rages in our life, we become fearful, we become Scared, we be, feel like we're isolated and alone. We feel like we're unloved by God. But, but in reality, we put ourselves in that position. So can someone who's fearful cry out to God? Let me ask you, you answer. Can someone who's fearful cry out to God? Absolutely, yes. Psalm 107, 28 through 32 is the answer. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still. And the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet. And he brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love. For his wondrous works to the children of men. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people. And praise him in the assembly of the elders. When we realize that God is in control when we realize that God is sovereign, that, that, that all things are under Him, and when we cry out to Him, it is then that He calms the storm. We're to cry out and thank Him for His steadfast love. God is pursuing you. Whatever situation you're in in your life right now, God is chasing after you. God is calling out, where are you? And God does this in several ways. And real quickly, I'm going to read these last few verses. Listen to what God does 
as he pursues you, as he looks for you, as he cries out, where are you? Verses 33 through the end. This is what he does. He turns rivers into a desert, springs of water into thirsty ground, a fruitful land into a salty waste because of the evil of his inhabitants. He turns desert into pools of water, a parched land into springs of water. And there he lets the hungry dwell and they establish a city to live in. They sow fields and plant vineyards and get a fruitful yield. By his blessing they multiply greatly and he does not let their livestock diminish. When they are diminished and brought low through oppression, evil, and sorrow, he pours contempt on princes and makes them wander in trackless wastes. But he raises up the needy out of affliction and makes their families like flocks. The upright see it and are glad, and all the wickedness shuts its mouth. Whoever is wise, let him attend to these things. Let him consider the steadfast love of the Lord. And so when we get in these positions where we feel like we're lost and alone, like we're out there on our own, like we're not loved, like God's not there, know that He is looking for you, He's searching for you, He's calling out, where are you? And in some cases, He'll make the river of your life dry up like desert land. In some cases, He'll make uh, the livestock of your life gone. In some cases, he'll, He'll make all of those things that are wonderful and great that we've been relying on like nothing so that we'll turn to Him and cry out to Him. And in the desert of our pain, it'll be like springs of water as God answers us. Ultimately, the most barren desert of all of our lives was before Jesus came into the picture. When we're dry and and sorrowful and, and apart from God because of our sin, God sent Jesus to die on a cross for you and me so that we can be forever saved. And in our lives, as, re- as those who are de- redeemed, brought into the family of God, these same things continue as we find ourselves wayward, as we find ourselves rebelling, as we find ourselves turning a blind eye, as we find ourselves fearful because we've put our trust in other things. It's so easy to do. God still uses these things in our lives so that we'll cry out to Him. And when we turn to God and cry out to Him, He hears and He heals. I pray that if if there's anyone here this morning who is not redeemed, who's not been brought into the family of God through Jesus Christ and His blood on the cross, and I pray that today as we sing a song of invitation the praise Him will come in a moment, that you come forward and let us tell you about that. Let us tell you what following Jesus is like, being redeemed into the family. For those of you who are Christians who find yourself struggling in areas of of, of issue, of problems, concern, cry out to God. Cry out to God. He wants to help you. He wants to be there for you. He is looking for you, asking the question, where are you? So let's pray. Almighty God, I praise you for your word. I praise you for who you are searching for us. Lord, I pray that you would give us the strength, the courage, the wisdom to see that we are lost. So many of us lost and suffering. Give us the courage to cry out in those times. What a great that your love never ends, your love never fails. And you never give up on us, Lord. Lord, if there's anyone here who is not a follower of Jesus, who hasn't given their life, humbled themselves before you, repented of their sins, been baptized into the family, Lord, I pray that today they would do that. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.